is a great day. Happy Black History Month Day. <laughs> is, that, is that such a thing? Let's give ourselves a round. <laughs> I, I'm so happy to be standing up here because you're going to hear a lot of firsts today. We have come a long way. When I say we, it's Black History Month, so you know who I'm speaking of, right? Okay. I am the first black person who have ever held this job. And that means I'm also the first black woman to have ever held this position. That says a whole lot, doesn't it? It's why we're celebrating Black History Month, because we've done so much, we've moved up, broke ceilings, glass ceilings. We're recognized. There's a lot of history about black history that things are changing, whether you believe it or not. If you look around, you look at us, we're here in the environmental field. There's not often a lot of black people in the environmental field. Things are changing. We've had a black president. We have a black first governor in the state of Maryland, right? And so things are, and I say this a lot to my kids, to my children, we have a lot to be thankful for and celebrate. So let's keep doing what we do to continue to rise up, get into fields where we're not usually there, raise your hand up and do it scientific, engineering, all those fields, let's do it. Let's just keep pushing because those opportunities are there. We just have to go for it, okay? So that's my message to you all. I do wanna say this. I grew up in a very low income area. I don't know if any of you have this experience, but you know when you're little, you don't realize you're in a low income area and you're poor? until you get older and you look back and go, dang, we were broke, <laughs> right? Because I thought we were rich. I literally did. I was snooty, had my head up, walking in the neighborhoods, the poor neighborhoods. You know, like, oh, they don't have any money. And we were all broke, all poor. We had used furniture in our house. I do remember uh, like when the neighbors would get rid of their nice furniture, I would tell my father, I would go run upstairs to my dad and say, dad, someone's giving their furniture away down the, hall, down the street, let's go get it. And we would go get it, new chairs, and it's just great. So what I also noticed is when I got older is the neighborhood where we were we were in this little area, when we talk about environmental issues, I noticed that the area that I lived in was right by a rich neighborhood. They had all of these beautiful trees sucking in carbon, right? Beautiful for the, your air, circulation was better. They had green grass, we had dirt. We had not one tree in that area. And we would have to walk like five, maybe about four blocks to see, oh my God, look at this neighborhood. Look at the trees, look at the grass. It was just beautiful. So my message is all of us have, should, we deserve to have access to clean water, clean air, and clean land, irrespective of what shade our skin is. Right? And that's where environmental justice comes in. Right? We have to make sure that what we're doing in this agency is protecting the environment. And it does not matter who you are, where you come from, you deserve a beautiful, clean environment. And so for each and every one of you who work in this agency, I thank you so much really, for all that you do to make sure that we're providing access that I just described to everyone. For the first time, I'll give you one first and then the other panel members will tell you if they 
are a first or not. This agency also, we've never had an assistant secretary for environmental justice until just a couple of weeks ago. So for the first time, we have an assistant secretary for environmental justice to make sure that we are protecting the environmental issues, con communities that expect us to be with them, to bring them to the table when we're making any kind of regulatory change that impacts their area, that they know about it, and we're making sure that we're doing what we need to do to protect them. That's Anika Ackerson. Let's give her, and she's gonna be up here to talk. We also have, for the first time, an environmental justice coordinator, a real one, in the office of the secretary, not one who's pretending to be one because it's really not their job, and it's a little side job. We've had little side jobs where people saying, okay, I'll do some of that, but we have a real environmental justice coordinator, Brandon Brooks, right here up in the front. Another first. All right, so with that, I don't need to get into all who I am and you all know who I am. I'm just so happy to be here to break that ceiling and to represent. And I'm glad we're having this moment together where all of you are here to celebrate us and what we've done and what we will continue to do to break those ceilings. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Good morning, my name is Dewan Lawrence. I also work here at MDE. Um, and to get things started, let's bring up our panelists. Yay. First, <laughs> first I'd like to bring up Dr. Nakalimbe. She's a assistant professor at University of Maryland. She's also a, the Africa program director under NASA Harvest. Next up, we have Jerome Foster, an environmentalist, environmental activist representing the White House. Jerome, please come forward. And our very own Assistant Secretary, Anika Atchison, please. Doctor, please tell us a little about yourself and your work. Um, thank you. It is uh, a wonderful honor for me to be here. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite fascinating, one, to be at MDE. When I was growing up, I dreamed to be an environmental scientist. I did environmental science and uh, went on to do geography and environmental engineering at Hopkins. And I actually thought I could work in this department, but then went on to do my PhD at the University of Maryland in geographical sciences. Um, but it's... Uh, it's quite an honor to be here, and I've you know, just been looking at the screen up there, and um, there's so many things in the world that we don't know exist, and it is important to know that they exist, the creativity, the contributions of different individuals, and I think that's what, you know, why we're here today. So, um, about myself, so I'm originally from Uganda. I moved to the U.S. in 2008 uh, to do my master's at Hopkins. I've, as I mentioned before, I've always loved the environment. I, my first experience doing field work as a real environmental scientist was in the mountains in Uganda, and it was raining, and I remember being alive. I remember this photograph that was taken that I look at even now and just remember the feeling of being in a forest, even though I grew up in a city, so my neighborhood is not so different um, from, from what we just heard. Um, but being in that space sort of told me, or I felt like this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I dreamed that I could do field work um, <laughs> through and through, which I've not been able to do, uh, given that becoming a professor in the Department of Geographical Sciences is more, I spend more time teaching, doing research, and um, as part of my research, I'm now the Africa Program Lead under NASA Harvest. Uh, Harvest is NASA's Agriculture and Food Security Initiative. I'm the capacity, um, agriculture and food security thematic lead under another NASA program called uh, NASA Severe. Severe means to serve, which is we use satellite technology and remote sensing applications to bring them to communities that need to use them. So as part of this program, service is sort of a primary thing. And I think when we think about ourselves in the space of the environment, 
that's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, so that's kind of uh, a different way of telling um, about myself. And I hope you know, I can, if you have questions, I'll be here for a little bit after and I'm happy to answer those. Yeah. I grew up exploring rocks and, and creeks and my dad works for the National Rail System in the US. So we used to take a stop on every state and collect rocks and just appreciate the fact that we had the time and the ability because of a job to be able to go out and do those things. And as a young kid, I also studied astrophysics. My parents really um, taught me about the importance of STEM and, and being involved in, in many different aspects of technology and, and mathematics, especially being a black young man. There's so many different stereotypes that go against that, that kind of um, first perception that they would say when they see you. And I also, from that experience of studying astrophysics, had a deep fascination and wonder for external planets, but that quickly reflected on my own planet. And I was wondering, what does my role have and why is that same sense of awe and respect that we have for our other planets now reflected on the rivers and creeks that we experience in our own communities and that has led to my work that I do today to advocate on behalf of young people and on behalf of nature and because nature doesn't have its own advocate but we as its people should be a, a system of reciprocity in which we give back to that system and, and my work now in the White House, I've been working alongside young people in Gen Z to make sure that we have the representatives of the future at the table today and to make sure that we are involved in the decisions that would directly impact our future. As is stated a few times at the intro, my name is Anika Atkinson and I am your Assistant Secretary for Environmental Justice. I hail from Philadelphia, not too far from Boston and a lot of similarities. Um, before joining your team, I was actually with the National Audubon Society, and prior to that, I was with the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, Protection excuse me, for 15 years in the water program. And when I left um, Pennsylvania DEP, I was the Deputy Secretary for the Office of Water Programs. So there was a lot of firsts <laughs> that I made um, within that agency in Pennsylvania. Uh, I've always had an affinity for water. I don't, I, I love it. I just love what it can do. It's docile, but at the same time, it can slice you in half. And I have the pleasure to have played with it in many different aspects of um, my life through schooling and recreation. Um, so I always had a passion for it. But where I grew up, it was, I was always told that I wasn't allowed to play in it. <laughs> Or it, it, you know, we had Cobbs Creek, it was very polluted. Um, the Schuylkill River, the Delaware, you don't recreate in it and it's bad. And I could never understand why I was so limited and couldn't have access um, to water. And as I got older, my love for water and wanting to understand it continued to grow and that led to my schooling. So I have a master's in water resources and environmental engineering uh, from Villanova University. In undergrad, I went to Smith College in Massachusetts. So my love for water and science and STEM, which no one in my family knows where I got it from. I grew up in the inner city, Southwest Philly, part of a project, a, a housing project. My fam, I'm first generation, still not exactly sure where I got that niche and wanted to pursue it, but my family, um, they backed me. They said, we don't know what this engineering is. <laughs> we don't know why you want to do it, um, but we're going to find with limited resources we have to, to get you um, to that place. Now, one thing that was very not unique to me in growing up in inner city Philadelphia is that I lived in the housing projects. Right across the street from our home was a scrap metal yard. A block away was one of the largest dry cleaners. A little over a mile away, a little less than a mile away, was the, ba the baking company. So I could see suds coming out the manholes, walking down the street. Traffic, you know, truck traffic and noise all day and night, people coming in and out of the scrapping facility. And then I could smell Amarosa bread. Beautiful smell um, from those who were baking the bread that we use for the famous Philadelphia cheesesteak right down the street. So I was in a very um, interesting environmental justice neighborhood. But if you would have told me, similar to what Serena said, that I was, I didn't have, or I was poor, or I was being overburdened, I didn't know that. You know, we played, I played with my friends. We would sometimes climb the gate at the scrapyard. We would, you know, see the suds and kick them down the street, right, um, that were coming from the dry cleaner. I didn't know, and it wasn't until I was able to explore these other arenas through education that I started to realize that there was, there was a discrepancy here, that I was getting more of something that I, the bad of the environment and none of the good. So that is what has led my work in public um, 
in government and even my short stint in uh, nonprofit is to one, I'm tired of us having to be resilient. We should be good. <laughs> we should be good like everyone else. You should have the same clean air, clean land, clean water as the people next door. My nieces and nephews should know um, that they're being overburdened and that they need extra protections. I, I, I really um, put that into all of my work. And I look forward to doing that here in Baltimore as we, we go forward. And one thing that I'll, I'll leave you with about going full circle and us getting involved and being at the table, right? Because now it allowed me to be in politics. As deputy secretary, I have to be at the table. Uh, I won't always say being at the table doesn't necessarily mean you get listened to. Um, but being at the table, I got to make some, some decisions. And one thing that was very unique to me uh, and, and came back is I was on a pre-application meeting for a project that was about to come into the city and I sat down and, you know, the pre-applications, they come in all the time. They give me a packet to let me know. And I sat down in this meeting and they said, hi, we're here to talk about the redevelopment of the Pasco Village housing project in Philadelphia. So I got to sit in the pre-application meeting when they came in to tell me that they demolished the housing project where I live. They were rebuilding it, incorporating green infrastructure, adding all of this insight to the community where I once lived that was completely overburdened. It got to go full circle. Um, I had a limited part in that, and the rest of my colleagues did that, but I was in that room. And no one that I worked with at the time knew that. No one knew my story, but that was my story. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to kick off the conversation by talking about Black History Month and what it symbolizes. So uh, starting here on the end, Dr. Nakalimbe, how should we utilize Black History Month and the messages moving forward? <clears throat> From my perspective, I think, uh, you know, Black History Month is so important, uh, you know, given we've had about uh, so many firsts. So firsts mean different things depending on where you are. Um, in the field that I work in, um, you know, ge geographical uh, sciences, remote sensing, um, in the past you would go to a conference and, you know, you'd look around the room and it would just be you. Um, but one thing that you wouldn't know is that you're probably not the very first in, in that particular space. And the other thing is about um, appreciating what others have done. I use this example a lot. Um, I went to, so for one of my uh, research projects, I go to NASA centers all the time. Um, and I went to, uh, I think it's the one in Huntsville. And they usually give us, you know, all sorts of things to bring back home. So I come back home with a, a packet. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever seen this, but you should Google it. It says women of color at NASA. And it has an image of women of color, you know, dressed in astronaut suits. So this is, for me, it's not, it's not new that there were women at NASA who are working in science who've done amazing work. Katherine Johnson as an example. I bring this packet back home uh, and I leave it on the table because I usually, I don't want to, I have twin boys, so I don't want to buy them stuff. So I always bring, you know, when there's free stuff, you have to bring it. Um, and when they came home, uh, one of them was like, oh, there's mommy. And he, he moved on, you know, he looked at this, he, gl he glanced at the picture. And it was like, oh, mommy. And then he, he didn't actually look to see the faces. Um, but this story is powerful um, because having these women on this, um, and this one page, it looks really good. You should, you should, check, you should check it out. And then their stories are sort of written on the back. And then you see that, you know, when opportunity presented itself, they were already ready. They were working really hard, and they were doing amazing work. And uh, recognizing this, you know, I kind of said to myself, if I had known these women growing up, I'd probably be an astronaut too, right? I would dream that I would be this. And I think the importance of Black History Month is highlighting, in, in the case for science and, and the work that I do, highlighting what people have contributed. For example, the invention of environmental justice, you know, who came up with what environmental justice is and recognizing it and then reflecting uh, what it means, you know, for the entire world is, is, absolutely, is absolutely important. And I think environmental justice uh, as sort of a conduit for us to be able to heal the world, to work and do things, but recognizing the contributions and that the problems that we're facing right now are so grand and uh, we cannot undermine the 
contributions, importance, and creativity that comes actually through struggle. Um, some of the science that's been created from my, from my own perspective, the way I see the world or I perceive the world, or what I see as important and how it should be addressed is very different. And my ideas being uh, uh, having the opportunity to be on the table is what you know, yields these really, really creative ways of um, addressing some of the problems which we're, we're facing. But recognizing that there are so many trailblazers and the possibilities are huge if ever is given the opportunity. We will probably have never been on the moon without Katherine Johnson. And so recognizing that she did that aspires others to aspire to do that. Um, there are so many people that I now know, you know, as a full grown adult, that if I had known when I was much younger, it would have made a very, very, uh, very, very big difference in terms of the career that I, the career path that I chose. Um, I think I want to um, build on that exactly and, and, and really, acknowledge the impact of Black History Month as a moment for us to recognize that history lives on through its legacy and the, the figures who have allowed us to be able to live today. I know like I had the opportunity to intern for Congressman John Lewis and I learned so much from understanding the legacy through his work and a lot of the other interns I was working alongside were, were focused on, on women's rights or some were focused on racial justice and I was there focusing on the intersection between climate and economic justice and we had these really intersectional conversations about oftentimes the movements of the past were already intersectional in the same way because black women oftentimes are, are inherently I I, um, impacted by sexism and racism at the same time. And those intersections are ways in which we can think more holistically about the future and recognizing where it came from. And Black History Month especially is a moment in which we can understand also, where do young people play? How do we create intergenerational fellowships in which young people can learn from the wisdom and the, the, the work that has gone into where we are now? And I think building on that, we can think about the, the amazing words of, of, of James Baldwin, is thinking about what are the, the measures in which we are focusing on today? And it's be, it goes beyond inclusion, but goes into justice. And thinking, we don't just want to be integrated into a burning house. We want to be a part of a solution. We want reparations for not having having 40 acres and a mule. We want to be able to have the abolition of state-sponsored violence and for the abolition of fossil fuels. All these key measures that go beyond having firsts, but having those firsts be met with actions and tangible next steps for our communities to be, be felt whole again. And I think that is the, the real importance of Black History Month, is for that first step in which people are able to feel comfortable to talk about Black History Month and bring up the, the, the this pain and struggle that black people have gone through, and for us to continue and carry on that conversation into demanding tangible actions for us to make sure that next Black History Month isn't the same sort of celebration in which we're talking about the same struggles, the same issues, but we're able to say last year, because of this month, we're able to make these actions. And now this year, these are the next steps we need to see for us to be able to, to celebrate next year. We've had important black environmentalists, environmentalists like George Washington Carver help the American landscape. What effect does the environmentalists have on their future for future leadership development? I think it has a huge effect. Um, as one of the panelists already said, is if you see it, you can be it, right? And, that, and that's, that's it. <laughs> when I walk into a room or when I'm talking to high school students or I'm mentoring someone, they see me and they can be me, right? They ask me questions, well, how did you get here? Or, or I walk in and I'm the only one and they see me. And I, I see people, kids, adults, I see people's eyes light up when I walk in a room, black and brown children. I, I would, and I, mine do too, because I'm like, oh my goodness, you're in the room. Because I've been doing this for a very long time and it's often I'm the only person in the room that looks like me. And sometimes it gets it gets lonely, but I can say that I have gotten excited. This rooms that I've been walking into lately, as I walk look around, and I'm like, oh wow, there's women here, there's people of color. Like we are, it's incremental, and I would love to see it speed up. <laughs> um, but they're seeing us 
and knowing about our achievements, and I don't want to put myself up there with George Washington Carver because that's not it. Too late. But <laughs> but when you see it, you can be it, and that's all I you know that's what I preach. So days when I'm tired and the school says, hey, do you want to come and give a speech? I'm there, you know, or the YMCA say, can you come talk to the kids? I'm there. I'm and sometimes I'm just in the audience, or sometimes I'm playing with the kids with the blocks, or you know I'm not in this official capacity, but they can see what I'm doing and know that there's a possibility and there's a place that they can be in and that this work is rewarding. If you could, share some of your stories or strategies for empowering communities where we can make these words become actions. Absolutely. Uh, there are many different programs um, which we can get involved in now for black communities to be able to take advantage in federal programs like a Justice 40 initiative um, that has allowed for 40 percent of investment benefits to reach frontline communities. And even today they've announced four point, uh, the Biden administration has announced $4.5 billion to communities in Pennsylvania's 12th and 17th district. And it's to revitalize their, their wastewater management and also clean water infrastructure for aging, uh, in, for aging infrastructure in a lot of black communities. And a lot of programs that often fall short of reaching tangible actions is first making sure communities know about those programs so that they can be able to take part in them because oftentimes that federal government dollars can go to state the state, state leaders in some cases that are have racist local officials may not reach those communities. And it can be swindled in the case of like Lower Ninth Ward in Louisiana, where after Hurricane Katrina, black communities were supposed to get funding to rebuild their homes. But the state local government officials basically swindled that money to the Upper Ninth Ward, which was predominantly white and wealthier community. And that exacerbated the impacts of it. So it's the, these programs not only need to be created, but also amplified and, and have community outreach programs that build awareness, build participation, and build long-term engagement. So it isn't just a one-off funding opportunity, but it's a long-term structure in which communities can receive support. Um, I think other ways in which we can also build is, is to increase awareness for young people and, and to build environmental education as like a core subject in schools. Because as young people, oftentimes the only time we hear about climate change is in a crisis. And seeing it as this sort of ticking time bomb for us to feel like, well, our adult going to do something? Or will our futures be saved? By the time I'm 50, will I be able to have clean water and access to a livable planet? And sometimes it can feel like we don't. And if schools have education structure where they're able to educate us and understand that, oh, here's locally sourced foods. Here's the ways in which recycling isn't, it's not about the solution of it on a personal level, but about how we as humans can change our behavior to be able to live more in succinct with, um, live more in tune with the planet. But also what's key and in building out um, education that I haven't seen a lot of um, schools do so far is talking about how we as individuals and as employees impact the systems in which we operate in. Change often happens in which students rise up and raise awareness to our, our teachers saying, well, what are you doing with the energy you're producing from the school? Where we step out of school and we demand local officials take action on climate change. When when employees go out and go on strike and say, hey, we're gonna, we don't want this anymore because you aren't, emit, you aren't reaching your um, emission targets and you are actually going backwards and doubling down and continuing to, to go into bed with the fossil fuel industry. Those are things which we can do with to educate and to empower young people to know that they are instruments of change and that to be activists is just to use your voice and to go out in the community and to unite people to know that changes, change happens when just 10 of us give a call to our elected official because that changes things. And I've seen like for, for one example, like the biggest thing that for me interning in, um, in Congress and me working in the White House now as a key change lever is people calling the office Offices. Like Congressman John Lewis was a key figure in, 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 in Congress. He was known as the conscience of Congress. And he only got 10 calls a day. And after the week, as an intern, I would have to tally up each call and say, well, what issue did that fall in? Does that fall under reproductive freedom? Does that fall under climate? Does that fall under racial justice? And if only 10 people called and all of them called about health care, that was his main priority for the next week. So if everyone in this room just picked up a phone and called a specific member of Congress, that would bring the tally up to 20. And that congressman for the next week would have to make that priority, climate justice, racial justice, et cetera. And that's something that we have to raise awareness of those measures, those programs, and things like that. Awesome. We can take the time now to open up the, the floor to questions, if there are any. I have okay. a question. Please. Um, for all of you guys, but specifically for you, young man, because um, I wanted to ask, and I wrote it down because I, I can be wordy. 
um, you know, we tend to, um, you know, focus Black History Month on, you know, the things, the big things that these certain people did to make big changes you know, th these facts, like she didn't sit, you know, get up off the bus, or he, you know, initiated the, the boycott. But change doesn't happen like in a vacuum, whether it's positive or negative. Even the negative changes, there were little teeny steps that were taken that led to the thing that we see now that some people can dismiss so easily as like, oh, well, why don't you just do this? Not considering how we got there. So my question was, for all of you, but I said especially for you because, I'm sorry if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? I'm just uh, 21. Okay, you're the same age as my child. And she is, you know, we have these kind of conversations and she gets frustrated with the, with her peers being so dismissive of how we actually got here. It can be uncomfortable, it was ugly. No, Nobody wants to live in the past, but when there are certain things that really look the same, just the 2024 version of what you saw in the 80s that was supposed to have changed based off of something that happened in the 60s. It can get annoying when it's like, well, how come you don't feel more passionately about this thing? So my question for you guys, again, especially for you because of your generation, why do you think that it's important to recall those things that led to, for instance, some of the um, the disparities that you notice environmentally in black neighborhoods as opposed to other neighborhoods, understanding that black people, people, I guess, disproportionately are going to occupy those poor neighborhoods. Why do you think it's important to continue to recall what happened, and how do you think that that recollection is going to affect things getting better for, for you without, you know, always talking about, like, oh, well, slavery. Yeah, but all of the things that happened after that, and now this. You get what I'm saying? Did yeah. It, okay, so. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I really thank you for that question, because I think, it, like, even some of my friends, they're oftentimes disillusioned by just that feeling of, like, well, like, change isn't happening now, or, like, the, the, the issue of, like, well, slavery, like, what are, what, are, what measures are being happening, what measures are happening today, and, like, also issues of, of communities, like, why is there such a, a massive correlation between black communities and also the fact that we're still having pre-existing, like, pre-existing conditions to be at the front lines with so many social issues. And I think one thing that is really important for young people to, to know is that, like, to bring up more recent examples. Like, there can be examples of the fact that, like, showing the lead up and the through line to today, because a lot of, a lot of young people feel kind of tuned out. Like, oftentimes it just feels like another thing on the camel's back, because there's already so many other issues that, like, as a young person, you're having these two competing forces where, like, you're young and you had like readings and texts as like in our English classes and like a lot of them were about slavery they're about like this animal species dying and then the English teacher would be like casually write a five page essay on this and that allowed us to disconnect the, the severity of the issue because it became so talked about in so many ways. And I think what's so important now is to kind of pivot to say, well, what can we do that, that brings that narrative to today? Like one, one example like, uh, that I do is like, I talk about how environmental racism is, is, is linked to the, the history of redlining in the US. Like 78% of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal power power plant, but we only make up 14% of the population. And that is an example environmental racism. And we can go back to the 1980s in which they're excluded from, from, um, from uh, uh, real estate investment, et cetera, et cetera involved in environmental activism is because I saw my science teacher, he like saw the Clean Energy DC Act was a bill that was being proposed in DC in 2018. And he basically recruited two young people um, and said, hey, can you raise awareness and get more people to come out to this bill for it to be signed? And a lot of young people were like, why should I care about this? And then he laid out all the measures and we realized, oh, well, this actually like changes so much in our community. And that would give so much more funding for us to like do X, Y, and Z. And then because of that, I went there and I was the only young person that ended up showing up the first time they testified. And I saw like a massive shift in that no one thought this bill was gonna pass. And that from young per one more young person showing up, all the council members basically had a, a split, split vote. 
and they had to go back again and they had seven more hours of testifying and we had 28 young people 28 or 29 young people come from our school and we more teachers came involved and they felt more empowered because right after we all testified they unanimously supported the bill and I think connecting uh, like our actions as people to the ability for policy to change is a lot more empowering because it feels like after the 2000s like a lot of problems can't be solved anymore because there's politicians ignoring the will of the people and if you let young people know that change can happen and change is happening now it allows us to feel like yeah let me get involved let me get engaged like let me continue to protest let me continue to get out on the streets because it does make a difference uh, thank you Dr. Nakalambray, um, we'd love to hear you talk more about your work and how it empowers those in different communities it inspires you Thank you. Uh, I'm going to add just one one thing to, to the previous question, I think. So I work on, um, I do remote sensing, I develop uh, products that we use for monitoring agriculture. So these include uh, cropland, la cropland maps, crop type maps, we do yield estimation, we use machine learning, uh, cloud computing, and satellite data to do this. And one of the most powerful tools, which I would share a blog um, that I found recently, is about storytelling. Um, so storytelling with maps. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is, to show change over time. Usually you can see this very well with maps. I always think in terms of maps, so if we're looking at deforestation, for example, we can look back from the 80s and see how things have really rapidly changed. And then you can start to question, why did that happen? Well, there were, you know, there's an explosion in the need for beef. Then we changed all the crop, all the forests into cropland or soy so we can you know send um, feed to animals and then uh, maybe there's a drastic change uh, maybe the community pushed back and then there was reforestation you, the way I see I'm telling this um, you know with words the way I see it is through like maps sequence of things and the same thing with um, the example of the neighborhood that you you mentioned you can show going backwards it was all concrete and at some point a policy happened and a transition then we see trees and we see an improvement in the environment we can can quantify all of those things. So that's sort of like the central part of my uh, my research uh, is to be able to measure and look at these long-term things over really, really large areas, and that's what satellites allow to do allow us to do. So I can look anywhere in the world. But a central component, um, you know, which is you know some of what you are hinting on, is about the community that is on the front line. So we can develop really good maps. We can say, yes, deforestation is happening at a rate of X in region Y. Um, we can say maybe Y, we can figure it out. But if the community that is actually uh, being uh, displaced, um, that is paying the ultimate uh, price for the pollution that might be coming from agriculture that is coming to their, their neighborhood is not fully aware of this information, then it is not useful. It is useful maybe from a very broad global perspective. We can you know, say country X should stop doing Y or this particular region should stop, you know, I don't know, growing a certain crop. If the community is not fully aware of the consequences of what's happening, they're not empowered to fight back. They're not empowered to communicate what exactly is happening um, in their re in in their region and what it means for their future generations as well as for their current uh, for their current situation. And so, f within my work, a, a a big priority as we're doing you know fancy remote sensing and um, quantifying all these things is involving end users. So end users can be defined many different ways. It could be Department of Environment uh, in Kenya, as an example. It could be the Ministry of Agriculture in Mali. It could be the Food Security Division in Rwanda. Um, and they can create really informative products and they can you know, put up maps and reports, but they're meant to inform the decision maker that can then help the community, you know, bring food aid if there's a, 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 a drought or something like that. But um, if the community is fully aware of the reason why something is happening, they can better advocate, they can organize. And I think that's where I see a lot of the potential because there's so much science, so many really interesting, very clear pathways to addressing some of the problems that we're facing. But from a decision-making standpoint, from our, our decision makers, 
as you were saying, prioritize what they see. If the communities don't, you know, in some cases go out on the streets and demand, you know, we need this, then there is no way that that will be addressed. And so that's sort of like a primary component. So I do a lot of capacity building as part of my severe work um, and work all over the world, um, working to enhance use of satellites for measuring, quantifying, and tracking changes. And then through that, uh, having pathways to lead into decision making, for example, providing alternative sources of income, which could actually be uh, rebuilding a community's forest as, uh, as an alternative source of income when a drought happens. Or another way would be to facilitate rapid response in case of a disaster. So uh, figuring out where should we start in the case of emergency and where are people have been hurt the most severely, as well as tracking what happens after that, uh, trying to show X, Y, Z was done and you know things are back to normal or there's still a long way to go. We'll take one more question from the audience. Ma'am? Good morning. Uh, I'm Ayana Minaj. I worked here at the department for 19 years. So one of the, I, this is actually not a comment, I mean a question, but more so a comment. And I think that the department here, one of the things that I would like to see is during the new employee orientation that you show the new employees what types of envir environmental justice, climate change issues, problems that exist here in the state of Maryland. And I think that that would gain, help, help them to gain an understanding of what it is that we're working towards achieving. So, I've done this uh, with a group here called uh, the Interfaith Partnership for the Chesapeake. They did an environmental justice tour of Baltimore City and Baltimore County. And I was very surprised the type of disparity in the garbage and the debris that the um, industry leaves in certain neighborhoods. And I think some of us would be very shocked to understand and see how people are dealing with serious uh, lung capacity uh, issues because of the air issues that exist in these neighborhoods. So one of the things I suggest is allow new employees to see, go to these neighborhoods, go to these um, um, uh, under, I don't know what you call it, underprivileged, underrepresented uh, neighborhoods and see the type of damage that they are experiencing. Uh, from the industry and on their health. Thank you. We're running a little early, so we can't take one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll probably pass the mic. Oh. Um, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you all for coming and being inspiring, for sharing your stories, and for all that you guys have done for our people, because this is definitely what Black History Month is about. And I'm just happy to be in the room with y'all. <laughs> uh, hi, so um, in double backing on the conversation about having a seat at the table and just knowing how, um, when you get into environmental spaces, because I'm coming from the natural resources field and also, and then transferring over here to ME, and a common thing that I have noticed is that once you get to those higher positions and also, you know, just those positions of leadership, it does seem to be a trend. What um, programs, if any, or advice can you provide to help black people and people of color obtain those skills that make them more eligible to be in those positions? Because it seems like the deck is stacked. Um, and some of us really do have um, just uh, we, we have that desire to be at the table because even though we have these job positions, we're still in those com communities that are impacted. Um, and we see that some of the goals that are being obtained aren't necessarily helping to minimize that. Um, and you compile that with inflation, um, with the cost of living, um, with the with affirmative action being overturned in universities that have 
the courses that will educate people because um, a lot of HBCUs don't have environmental programs unless you go down south and you see like um, uh, Florida A&M that has their agricultural programs and stuff like that. But the ones up north don't necessarily cater to those tracks. So do you all know of any programs that exist or initiatives to help um, make black people and people of color more eligible to be in those um, roles of leadership? Um, so one thing I, I will say, and I, and I think when I mentioned being, having a seat at the table, right, there's, there's a distinction between having a seat at the table and then having your voice be heard. Um, so I want to always prepare people for that, right? There's, you know, when I started getting a seat at the table, I was excited. I said, I can help my people. But there's a lot of times I was a photo op. Um, I would be in rooms and be completely dismissed or ignored, either as being black or being a female or being both. Um, even though I have all the schooling and, and sometimes more schooling than the other people around me at the table um, and, and worked in this field. So uh, caution there. But there are programs out there, and I think, um, Jerome, you kind of spoke to this. There's a lot of programs out there that we just don't know about. Uh, a lot of my, my involvement came out of curiosity at like high school level. Like I started asking a lot of questions. And if you're here now, you'll probably know I ask a lot of questions. But I ask a lot of questions to learn. It's not because I'm questioning you. I'm trying to understand, right? Um, so that's always kind of been my thing ever since I was younger. So I would always ask questions. Um, but one of the things that really helped me was NSBE as an engineer. So that's the National Society of Black Engineers. Um, they do work in middle school, even some grade school, up and through college. And it's not just engineers, but it's a group of um, black students mainly and uh, organization that is run to, to tell you what classes you might want to take, tell you where the opportunities are, um, really instill some of the... Uh, let me see, the backbone you'll need to be in some of the situations that you're going to be once you decide to go down certain career paths. Um, it's, it's, and I'll also say, others had said this, but the environmental space is not black. Like it's not, and from my perspective, a lot of that is it's because it's, it doesn't pay well. <laughs> um, just to be frank, right? It's, it's a very, I remember one of my, um, uh, co-workers who are of a different skin color was like, oh yeah, it was easy for me to get this. I just did this internship and blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, I couldn't do that internship. They were only paying like, you know, $6 an hour and you had to move down to the coast and do this. And she's like, well, I just stayed at my grandparents' summer house and then we did this. And I'm like, well. <laughs> Well, that already means I couldn't be there, right? So I did this other program where, where I got a little bit more money because I didn't have those opportunities or uh, afforded me. Um, and a lot of people don't, you know, in, in this environmental space don't realize that. It's a, it's a very, um, you get a lot of award, is rewarding, but um, it, it's, not, it's not the money maker, uh, to be frank. And that, that's changing, but it's still not. If you go out, you know, if you go out into the uh, private sector, you, you could probably increase your income so many folds um, but yes there's there's it's just getting connections to those different programs and I can say now I know a heck of a lot more about what exists out there how to connect to them than I did when I was younger so definitely come and see me if you want to talk about some stuff um, and some opportunities that are out there but All right thank you everyone um, we will be staying around for a little while afterwards please come around socialize Appreciate you coming out. On behalf of the secretary and everyone else, have a great day.